over to you, uh, Dominic. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for the invitation and it's lovely to see you all. As the sun is nearly set where I am just outside Cambridge, um, so it's, it's uh, dark times in some senses, in many senses. I've called this talk the framing of education and I mean that in the criminal sense as well as in the theoretical sense. Um, and my talk today is based mainly on three projects. Um, one was a competitively tendered project called the Close to Bureau Close to Practice Research Project, uh, an article published in the British Educational Research Journal. Uh, I, I'd also done a series of theoretical analyses uh, prior to my presidential address, uh, which pick up some of the same themes. Um, that's also been published. And then finally, uh, some earlier work in the introduction to the Bureau Stage Handbook of Educational Research. And we, we did a 10, myself and the other editors did a 10,000 words, um, new contribution really, rather than simply a normal introduction. Anyway, um, and also I should say that much of this material you can read in what I think is a first, it was a co-produced blog, Era's, one of ERA's first blogs for their new blog and a co-production with ERA. So, framing of education, what, what is the problem? Well, I think education research has been sharply criticized for being weak in comparison with research from other disciplines. And some of this criticism has suggested that education is, if I can say, not a proper academic discipline. Of course, I'm not saying I believe this, <laughs> as you'll hear. So not a proper academic discipline when compared to other disciplines. And so some people will then just describe it as, an, as a field or an applied subject. Well, why does that problem matter? Um, well, in my view, I think categorizing education properly matters because an area of knowledge described as a field is often seen as substandard compared to an area described as a discipline. Uh, to give a, an example from a different discipline, more than 20 years ago, Rosemary Deem noted the effects of di discrimination in her university sociology department. And, and she attributed this in part, this dis uh, discrimination to distinctions that were made between theoretical sociology, regarded as high status and a masculine preserve, empirical sociology and applied sociology, which was generally regarded as being of somewhat lower status, uh, mind you, essential for would-be social workers, the practitioners, and of, as she said, also female dominated. And th those debates 20 years ago in sociology, which continue uh, about knowledge and its organization can be seen mirrored in some debates in university education departments in the 21st century. For, for instance, um, the debates about inequitable salaries, gender and so on, the place of teacher education and training in relation to academics being quotes research active, lecturer identity and promotion at work, and theories of education as an area of knowledge. Another reason why I think the framing of education as a discipline rather than a field matters is because well, let's face it, we're all in the business of accuracy and correctness in relation to any area of knowledge. We spend lots of time arguing about these things, so we may as well have an argument about what, what we mean by education as an academic discipline. And of course, we should also draw on um, robust evidence sources for our views. And so one of the things that I uh, read while I was working on some of this was a paper um, by the ESRC's National Center for Research Methods. Um, and it was all about how, how are disciplines um, conceived in a way. And it, it, had, it, it arrived at six criteria. And the most important of these was that, and I quote, disciplines must have some institutional manifestation in the form of subjects taught at universities or colleges, respective academic departments, and professional associations connected to it. So education not only clearly meets this criterion, but also in my view, the other five of the NCRM's paper. 
So education has number one, a particular object or focus for its research. Two, a body of accumulated specialist knowledge specific to the discipline. Three, theories that organize or frame the specialist knowledge. Four, specific terminologies. And five, specific research methods. Now, I'm not for one moment suggesting there's universal agreement on the manifestation of these criteria in education, but I am arguing that sufficient evidence exists to depict education as an academic discipline. Okay, and so in the final bit of what I'm going to say today, the question is what should be done? Well, as you all know, maybe painfully know, we're approaching the final dates for all university submissions for all academic disciplines to the UK's Research Excellence Framework, the REF. Um, now, the most important outcome of the REF, of course, um, in terms of research quality in the UK will be the dividing of a substantial stream of government research funding by universities and by disciplines for what is likely to be at least five years. In other words, will be, there'll be winners and losers in terms of institutions. And this allocation um, will have implications for all disciplines. For example, the capacity to maintain research capacity, including people's research careers. But another important outcome is the rest data, the analyses, the reporting that's done on research outputs and research environment and impact that can be seen as a measure of the state of academic disciplines. I did some secondary analysis of this kind of data for my presidential uh, paper. And for me, the story of these reports, the REF reports by the different panels and the different subject groups, begins with the description of each discipline. Um, and in the two papers I mentioned, myself and my fellow researchers argued on the basis of these new analyses that it's essential that any REF description of education and by implication any institutional submission for a department of education clearly portrays education as an academic discipline rather than a field. Now one possible counter to this argument is, um, and it's a, it's a kind of positive counter in a way, is that education is also known as a social science and it's true that some research concerned with education may be better described as social science than as located squarely in education as an academic discipline. I'm thinking, for example, of things like um, the enormous birth cohort studies, uh, some of which we run at the IOE, UCL IOE. But education also includes work in the arts, for example, work funded by the AHRC. And it's this kind of interdisciplinarity that I see as one of the great strengths of education. It's been present since the start of education departments in the UK's universities about 50 years ago. But the core of education research with relevance to education practice and education policy is the, the academic, what I'm describing as the academic discipline of education. And so describing education as a field is likely to have negative consequences which risks damage to the future progress of education as a discipline in universities and possibly even as a force for good in wider society. Surely that is a risk not worth taking. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. That was really interesting and a good start to our panel provocations today. So I'm now going to hand over to John. Yes. First of all, thank you very much for um, inviting me. Um, so, and that's also a great thanks to um, to Sarah. And uh, we think in Nera, we're very happy that uh, that Sarah has uh, reached out uh, in order to get a, a, a more profound uh, collaboration between us. Um, we will continue that in the years to come. Special thanks to to Paul, Nicola, and Angela for that. And uh, we see this as, 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 as part of this uh, uh, ongoing work. Uh, I see it also as an opportunity to think or rethink old relations between uh, Scotland, Denmark, the Nordic countries, and thanks uh, England and Ireland for your presence as well and the opportunity to do likewise. We share many roots um, uh, 
thousand years back, uh, which you can see in names and uh, uh, um, common heritage everywhere. Anyway, my background uh, for being here also is uh, being a president of the Nordic Educational Research Association. That is uh, a conglomerate of uh, five different nations and uh, having been also the Nordic appointed council member to uh, the European Educational Research Association from 2009 to 2018 and uh, uh, dealing with uh, the Nordic region and uh, uh, the European region, I think, has made me a little obsessed with the uh, meta spaces. I think meta spaces are, are very important uh, for education, not only the Nordic region or for us uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 and uh, the UK for you and the Commonwealth for you and uh, the European, uh, the Europe, I would call it, for all of us and uh, the global. So. Uh, I would say my point of departure would be that uh, take, uh, it would be a focus on a meta perspective on what I would call a cosmopatriotic uh, educational vision. Or if you get continental, I would call it a, a cosmopatriotic educational building. Cosmopatriotic is the term that uh, the, the Dutch uh, researchers, uh, Urians and, and the Claude coined in 2007 in order to be able to think uh, or, or coin a concept about how you can be patriotic, meaning uh, being committed to the area and the place where you live in a, in a constructive and uh, a, a fruitful sense, while at the same time being open to diversity and the global. And I think it's important to think of that in, uh, 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 when you talk about school, because school and by implication educational research have always been central as a key nation and identity building uh, 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 tools. So in education and educational research, you have always uh, found uh, uh, um, uh, or, or been uh, uh, committed to dealing with visions for a better society on the one hand, and on the other hand, your uh, educational research has also been the carrier of uh, bigotry, nationalism, reproduction of social inequality, and so on. Education is deeply wound up in a transnational turn, the OECD, the IEA, and Bologna process, and so on, that tends to become too economistic versus uh, new nationalisms that are rife throughout Europe for the time being. So my argument is, and uh, 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 or what I would like to discuss is, what is this European dimension? And I call it, uh, um, what would be the unacceptable void without it? And I think that, think that needs a little explanation probably. So rhetorically, uh, uh, I would like to, to set up two questions. One is, uh, do, we, do we need a continuous, never closed debate about what constitutes the European dimension, meaning a, a floating signifier that uh, makes it possible for us to um, problematize uh, at least 2000 years of, uh, 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 what would you call it, of um, uh, collaboration and destruction among a lot of small and medium-sized countries. I think we need that. Uh, I think we have a lot of experience. I think there's so much experience in, 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 in that history together uh, that needs to be reflected upon in order to avoid war, in order to avoid national tribalism on one hand, and in order to prosper and nurture uh, this cosmopatriotism, because I think that's, uh, uh, that's the potential for that as well. Or on the other hand, are we just neighbors in pragmatic interaction on whatever we find it useful to work together on? So collaboration in, in Europe, is that mainly between nation states whose sovereignty should not be reduced to common frameworks or values unless national interest uh, tell us to do so. Yeah, that was a little, you asked for provocation. Um, so 
why do I ask for these meta spaces? I think these meta spaces, the Nordic for us or the European or the global are important or necessary because uh, um, they can help us uh, to affirm diversity and avoid this tribalism would be my argument. In a Danish sense, or uh, uh, and, and you can make uh, the reflections on, 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 on the Scottish situation yourself, but in a Danish situation, if you take, uh, uh, it could be school policy, but if you take uh, res educational research as an example, uh, you really need, I, th I would argue, uh, the meta space of the Nordic. Why is that so? Because uh, in Denmark, you have five and a half million people. About uh, three or four decades ago, it was commonplace to think that uh, Denmark had uh, probably the best school in the world. And that's a good sign that you probably need a meta space to get uh, problematized that space. And here the Nordic uh, uh, collaboration becomes a critical mass uh, or becomes a place where uh, five different countries that uh, uh, or where uh, uh, you have the Scandinavian countries uh, 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 with common languages uh, and you have uh, among these five countries common history, you have uh, pretty much common uh, uh, it, uh, societal systems. And uh, some people would ask, why is that not one country? But for uh, uh, thousands of reasons, uh, it's definitely not. And there are differences. But there are still so many similarities that uh, it becomes a place where a small country can build up a critical mass in dialogue with other small countries that have similar aspirations and systems uh, uh, with, uh, in, in relation to education and society. And it becomes a place where you can deal in your own terminology with building uh, your vision about education. Uh, and, and that is quite important before uh, we go international in the research community, which is mostly governed by Anglo-American norms. Because uh, when as a small country like Denmark or Norway, uh, you would go international, you would tend to need to make yourself a little bit exotic in order to become, um, what would you call it, to, to have some appeal in, in, in the larger inter international community. And that means that you would tend to try to make yourself interesting uh, by appealing to uh, interest in issues like the welfare state, gender equality, educational progressivism, and so on, which uh, often kind of live in the space between myth and reality. That's why we need the Nordic uh, uh, dimension in order to build up uh, uh, the local or the regional, uh, uh, what we call it, knowledge, so to speak, before going into the other meta spaces. But then you have the European space as well. And the European dimension, I would call it, uh, is a dangerous place, but it's also potentially, I would say, it's a fruitful cornucopia of ideas, practices, inspiration on the one hand, uh, uh, which has been built up over uh, millennia. Uh, um, and on the other hand, it's a dangerous hydra you know, the, the many headed monster that if you cut off one hydra head, two more uh, would grow back in its place because Europe is also a place of war and mutual destruction. So in that space, there should be so much uh, experience uh, to draw on. And of course, all this European dimension should, is always uh, dependent upon another meta space called the global dimension because it's all interconnected. And if you exclude the global dimension, it returns with revenge. We know all the dangers of Eurocentrism. And the last slide. Um, so is there a European dimension and what is it? I argue that the fruitful way of talking about the European dimension or Nordic dimension or global dimension is to talk about it as a floating signifier. That is something that should never become too static it's, it's a never ending discussion that never stops. It's an ongoing problematization within a space 
where you have been killing each other and collaborating for centuries. And you have been building up uh, problematics like uh, drawing on Greek democracy, Pax Romana, enlightenment, humanism, universalism, human rights, and things like that. These are issues that all have national particular uh, formulations. Uh, depending upon our national local needs, but they could not have been developed as my argument without uh, the European uh, dimension. So uh, I think I will stop by saying that uh, the argument is that uh, you should continuously uh, ask the question from the point of view of a potentially profoundly qualified pool of experience among a lot of very small countries with very big national egos. Uh, you should draw on that qualified pool of experience that have, uh, uh, what would you call it, that, that could give us so much knowledge uh, and critical mass on issues like uh, 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 power and uh, uh, education and uh, war and collaboration. And you should have the ongoing discussion. Is there a common set of values that guides or should guide education and research? And I think that could qualify uh, the way that Europe as a region could uh, be in the world. So the last, so the question would be, and the, the question you have gotten is that, that's a thought experiment. How would you imagine your national context with the European dimension erased? And what would be that, what would the consequences be for the imaginary of education? What are the pros and the cons? Thank you. Thank you, John. That has, was really interesting and, and really built well on what Dominic had been talking about in terms of thinking about that idea of um, education as a discipline and then you taking us thinking about the relationships within our own nations and then beyond that looking at European and, and global and these, these meta spaces and I think reflects well what we're looking to do this year with not being able to meet in person for our CIRA conference but what this opens up for us in terms of trying to look at these kinds of meta spaces so the questions that you pose are interesting and looking forward to looking at those in the group in the discussions so thank you and I'll move on to Celine. Great. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you very much, Angela. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation and ESAI looks forward to further collaborations um, and ongoing collaborations. Um, thanks very much too to, to John and, and Dominic. Um, I've got a little notebook full of, full of your ideas here. Um, thank you for that. Um, right. Well, you know, it's a two way thing. It takes two to cause a gap. In this case, the gap in question is between research and practice. They're working away, each in their own way, the researchers and the practitioners. And too often, the gap between the two remains unbridged. There isn't a clear framework by which to systematically engage teachers, principals, policy makers, etc. into the research findings and recommendations. The findings and recommendations of educational research are often not pertinent to the day to day practice of teachers. They're not generalizable to their classroom practice. Likewise, educational practice continues without being systematically integrated into the development and answering of research questions. The research continues around them and about them, but not sufficiently with them. Hargreaves refers to this gap as the fatal flaw in educational research. And this adjective, fatal, is ominous. 
if educational research is not accessible and not relevant and not useful to those working in the field, then that's it, it's lifeless. Condemned to remain in academic journals, on shelves, dead research. Teachers and school principals have limited time to devote to research outside of their own classroom activities. To access educational research often means expense, the articles being behind an expensive paywall. The educational research journals being made available only to those who have paid up membership of the association. And even when teachers can access the research journals, research jargon and syntax can pose, pose a further barrier, a wall. It's like arriving into another country with a foreign language. It's difficult to read. And it's difficult to access the content. Time is at a premium for busy professionals. It's understandable to ask, is persevering through academic articles a good use of their time? Professional researchers engage in broad consideration in education and seek generality. Teachers are more likely to be concerned with practicalities, with findings and recommendations that they can apply to their working context. They're looking for evidence to improve their practice, to better facilitate learning, to better teach, evidence to help them to empower themselves and their learners in their teaching and learning. However, academic research is often seen to play a controlling role, a support of a top-down approach, telling teachers what they should be doing. And add to this the perceived prestige of academic knowledge. Too often, it's believed to trump school knowledge, to trump practitioner knowledge. Doing nothing to bring the gap in, this widening the research practice gap. So is this gap continue, doomed to continue like a trench between those in educational practice and those in educational research? going to take a systemic cultural change to narrow the gap. Changes will be needed at policy levels, professional levels, personal levels and public levels. Policy around educational research needs to create professional contexts that are open to and supportive of change. Professional contexts that encourage and support collaboration between researchers and practitioners. Contexts where the fixed roles of researcher and practitioner become more fluid, less static. The professional groups need to be encouraged and facilitated to come together, to engage in professional dialogue and to work together. There needs to be increased coordination between acknowledge the differences between the professional groups, but also highlight the commonalities, the shared interest in education, in improving society through education, and work to share expertise with one another. This coming together may be mutually advantageous. Increasingly, teachers are encouraged to have their practice evidence informed. Researchers are increasingly asked to demonstrate the impact of the research related activities. The practice of the different professional groups can be brought into alignment through a coming together to discuss, share, challenge, reflect, inform. The diverse voices can be brought together through educational research communities of practice. 
The field of education is a normative one, informed by a vision of what education could be. Those of us involved have an understanding of the general purpose and aim of education, what's at stake in the field. We understand that associated interactions are linked and taken in response to one another. There's a mutual accountability in these actions and interactions, and they are evaluated in the context of the appropriateness to previous and current interactions. These understandings are what empower us working together to be leaders in education. If this is not acknowledged, then we run the risk of letting those who don't have these understandings trying to lead education. Look, for example, at the recent announcement um, by Governor um, Andrew Cuomo of the intention of the New York State to collaborate with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to develop a blueprint for reimagining education in the new normal. Does society want technology firms leading change in education? Or should that be the role of those involved in education, the education practitioners, the education researchers? Can either group do it alone? Not as well as they could together. Niñarka kur lekela, as we say in Belga, our strength will come through collaboration. The educational research field in Ireland has witnessed great changes over the past five years or so on the policy, professional, personal, and public fronts discussed earlier. All student teachers must now engage in a substantial research project in order to be accredited. For the first time, we have NQTs who have developed research skills as part of their professional formation coming into school. They have the skills with which to engage in research and the, the familiarity with the language of research to access academic articles on registering as teachers with the Teaching Council, they're given free access to online educational research journals. The Teaching Council also makes an annual bursary for research available to teachers. They're encouraged to discuss and to present their research and their research ideas at an annual teacher event called FELTA, which is a celebration of research and innovation in education. Here too, they'll have research meets where the teachers come together to share research findings, to explore and to discuss research ideas. Teachers entering the workforce in Ireland in the last few years have research skills, but they may find that they're the only one in the school with these research skills, or they may find that the only one in the school interested in engaging with and leading research. To support these teachers and others, an online community, uh, an online community of practice for educational research has been established. This is called Teachers Research Exchange, TREX. It's an online meeting place for teachers, student teachers, teacher educators, educational researchers, education administrators, all engaged in education. The community of practice is to support and facilitate the engagement in research projects across the roads. Those involved can find others to engage in research with. They can let others know about the research. They can publish the reports online. It facilitates a working between the different groups with an emphasis on all voices being equal, all contributions carrying, potentially carrying equal weight. So what can the educational studies Association of Ireland do to lead this change in collaboration between those involved in educational research. We have in recent years introduced a very successful early careers researchers strand to our annual conference. Perhaps now is the time to introduce a teacher's research strand 
where teachers share their research at the National Conference. Could we consider publishing a special edition on teacher research in our um, journal? Could we encourage the establishment of a teacher researcher special interest group? The setting and support for practitioner research for practitioners and education researchers working together is looking promising. However, teachers, like all professionals, are busy people. If it is policy in Ireland to encourage them to engage in research, then they need to be given time. Would it be possible for the Department of Education and Skills to allocate free classes to those who are involved in a research project? Would it be possible to timetable table them for engagement with others in their workplace to plan and carry out research? Would it be possible to have roles of responsibility for teachers involved in research? Could we offer an ongoing professional development for teachers who wish to be research active? And while I'm on the run of questions, uh, could university departments of education and colleges of education offer standalone research method courses for practicing teachers? These could, for example, be courses that are already running for MED research students. Could a bursary for attendance at these be made available by the Teaching Council or by the Department of Education and Skills? That's a lot of questions, but I think there are so many exciting possibilities out there just waiting to be seen we can bridge the practice research gap through a partnership in action, an authentic engagement between teachers and researchers to improve and to transform our education research. Educational researchers and practitioners, let's work together to reimagine education. Let's work together to make this world a better place through education. Thank you, Celine. That's really interesting. And again, linked very well to where we started with Dominic, thinking again about that idea of education as a discipline and linking that through what you're saying there. And then talking about the met and then John talking about the meta spaces. And I think you know we're start you're you're talking about that and some of your examples give some ideas of meta spaces in your national context within Ireland. And I think you know some of the things you're talking about there, even they're thinking from a Scottish perspective and from a Scottish Educational Research Association perspective, we're familiar with some of the things you're talking about there, the teaching council supporting research of teachers. And we certainly have that with the General Teaching Council of Scotland here. And as I said. You know, sponsoring this, uh, these events, these conference events for us this year and always contributing to our conference in CIRA. As you were saying about encouraging teachers to share their research, something we certainly looked at at our conference and have encouraged over the past few years and seen increasing numbers of teachers um, being involved. So um, a lot of similarities there and I can see that meta space starting. So I think it's going to link really well into the uh, discussion, the breakout rooms. So thank you very much. Thank you. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put people into discussion rooms. This will be done randomly using Zoom. Um, and in the discussion rooms, I am about to post into the chat, which should be available to everybody, the questions from Dominic and Celine and John. And you can use those questions to guide your discussion or anything that you feel came up from the panel provocations. What we'll then do is so we'll be in the breakout rooms for around about 20 minutes. We'll then return. And um, if you've got any points you want to share from your discussions or questions you want to raise, put them in the chat or raise your hand in a mute and um, we will uh, in engage in some discussion afterwards. I just say to the panel, we spoke about this. If you want to just wait, um, you'll be assigned a breakout room if you just wait um, and uh, before you go in there. Okay. So I will do uh, breakout rooms just now. Come back in 
If you have any questions or comments or thoughts that you want to raise, um, please do that um, in the chat or you can raise your hand and um, speak to the whole group. And so Angela's going to be keeping an eye on the chat. So to give you all an opportunity to put something into the chat, I will first go to the floor and see if there's anybody who would like to make a comment or ask a question to the panel. Um, so please raise your hand if you would like to. Anyone want to share anything from their discussions? I see Mark Landon, Langdon oh, there. Mark. Thanks, Mark. If you want to unmute and ask your question or raise your point, thank you. Hi, um, we had a really interesting chat in our group, but we had a, a friend from Mississippi in, in Ellen. Um, so we were having a, a discussion about sort of the, the global uh, state of of education and the political dimensions to that um, with a huge amount of, of political um, um, uh, involvement going on in different states and across the United States, but also seeing from down south the kind of attack on the critical race theory and, um, you know, guidance on anti-capitalist kind of materials. And taking John's point about the the importance of international dialogue and, and, and shared understanding. I'm just interested on the, the kind of panelists um, focus on research around those those kind of areas, and, and to what extent we need to maybe heighten the priority of looking at, at, at education of uh, as a, a way to promote a inter international peace and understanding uh, as something which becomes more and more relevant with each passing day, it seems. Over to the panel, Dominic, John, Celine, do you want to respond? Yeah. John? Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, well, I, I, I think uh, there's there's a huge need for building up research. I agree. I agree on that. And uh, but I also see it uh, in many areas. Uh, sitting on this uh, European Educational Research uh, Associations Council, um, parallel to reaching out to more and more countries uh, to develop their own uh, educational research associations. Uh, there was also this uh, building up of, uh, I think, research agendas, because by meeting continually, uh, you get this mutual interest in um, the comparative aspect. And, and, and uh, if you take the European Educational uh, Research Journal, for instance, uh, I think it has a lot of focus on uh, policy comparisons uh, you talked about uh, the critique of capitalism, the critique of um, education policy, if I understood you correctly. Uh, and in that sense, I think there's a, there's a, a booming uh, work there. Uh, but I think it could be driven by this great European tradition that I would like to uh, 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 battle a little for. Because uh, I would say that um, Scottish Enlightenment, now being in Scotland uh, virtually, uh, was a huge contribution to European philosophy, moral philosophy, uh, uh, with names like uh, Adam Smith and uh, David Hume. Um, but uh, I think uh, their, what we call the brilliance of their thinking, I think uh, it could not have been done without uh, this, uh, what would you call it, continuous uh, debates with uh, German colleagues, uh, French colleagues, uh, uh, Dutch colleagues, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think of the wonderful uh, debates between Isaac Newton and um, uh, Wilhelm Leibniz, uh, the German uh, rationalist uh, philosopher, 
uh, about how you should understand uh, what would you call it uh, uh, um, the influence uh, on of God on the total clockwork uh, of uh, uh, what would you call it of uh, the way that uh, 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 the universe was built up. I think. Uh, uh, both of them could probably not have developed their thoughts so far if they had not uh, uh, confronted each other. Thank you. Thanks, John, for your response. And thanks, Mark, for your um, thoughts there. Angela, can we turn to the chat? Is there any points to raise from the chat for the panel? There's a couple of points to raise from the panel. Um, and the first one that came up with was Paul Adams and Brexit. I'm going to come back to Paul in a couple of minutes' time because he came up with a better point rather than Brexit. Um, Jacob, um, I think this might be uh, towards yourself, John, and he was asked about the meta space. So where does the meta space start and isn't a national perspective quite meta already? Mm. So Jacob, I don't know if you want to elaborate a wee bit more, um, but that was the point that Jacob raised. Um, Thanks, Jacob. <laughs> I think from the beginning, the national idea maybe was a meta um, perspective from combining um, even smaller states. And I, I'm from Germany from the beginning. Maybe this is my my, um, my idea from collecting all these small states under one language, which then the German language means it's a, it's a meta language for many of us anyway. But um, yeah, is it still a meta space? The national sp uh, space, uh, or do we need more? That was my, Thank you. my idea. Thanks, Jacob. John or Celine or Dominic, do you want to respond to that? I know it was mainly you talking about that, John, but I don't know if any of our other panels want to respond. Panel members want to respond as well. May I just uh, shortly um, uh, answer Jacob? Yes, John, please. I, I just mean that this idea of metaspace, I, I like to see it as a scale uh, going from, I would, I would not, I would almost say from your neighbor to your neighbor, but it, it could be parts within the country and it could be the neighboring countries and it could be the region, it could be, and, and, and uh, I think the point is that, uh, what would you call it? In an educational perspective, I think it gives an inoculation um, uh, to self-satisfaction and it gives, uh, what would you call it, um, to all the other uh, aspects of education that I think Celine was also pointing to, that education is also a normative uh, endeavor. Uh, the things about uh, uh, vision, about what do we want with school, what do we want with education, uh, I think we need all the time this uh, diversity and this uh, strangeness from the other side of the border in order to kind of temper uh, the self-satisfaction somehow. So, uh, so I think, uh, yes, uh, uh, there's a difference from Hamburg to Bavaria. <laughs> and there's a difference from Berlin, I think, to uh, the countryside of uh, uh, Turing. But, and, uh, but, but then again, uh, there's a lot of tension always with uh, the other side of the border. And I think it's, it, it's the job of educationalists to always embrace that tension and uh, make it visible. Thanks, John. Celine, Dominic, do you want to come in or before we move on to any other comments? Yeah. Okay, Angela, did you see Paul Adams you were going to go to? Two other points. So I've got Paul for human flourishing, and I want I would like Alice and Murray to give a question. But if we can go to Paul first, because Paul, your comment about human flourishing got a, a mini discussion going in the chat. So do you want to pose your question about human flourishing and values? Um, Thanks, yeah, I, I suppose it. This is because I'm a what um, the right would describe as a woolly-minded liberal. Really, um, I'm. I'm always concerned with educational research uh, that either um, policymakers or politicians want um, answers and they want them now. So they'll look in, in particular to psychology or biomedical kind of things in order to 
solve the problems and they'll do randomized control trials in order to to demonstrate that they've um, done experiments on with 10,000 children and they seem to demonstrate this and, and it strikes me that in in determining that they want these particular answers what they want is a a particular line to be taken and we all know what that is it's it's towards people getting a job and, and earning money so they don't become a burden on the state if ever people who are on welfare are a burden on the state i'm not sure they are but there you go and that's me being a woolly minded liberal again um and i'm i'm concerned really that that education should see itself and should be seen as um not the ability necessarily to to find questions to, to find answers sorry but the ability to generate even ever more sophisticated questions. Now, you know, answers will happen, but, but if, if all we do is we seek to answer something, then the problem is we put a break on, on knowledge and we put a break on, on progress. And actually what we should always be doing is, is seeking to generate new questions and new answers. So I'm always worried when I um, hear these books called, you know, Teach Like a Champion or Why everything you've ever done in the classroom is wrong and read this book and you'll know how to be a great teacher. That isn't a book title, by the way, but I can imagine somebody coming up with that. Um, and, and I worry about these sorts of things because what they do is, is they seem to say to everybody that if you, if you just simply follow this very simple rubric, you will be an amazing teacher. You will just be fantastic. And often what they mean is, you can control a class, you can plan a lesson, and you can assess. And really, that's what that's what they mean. And you can do lots of whizzy things with PowerPoint and that sort of thing that I still haven't worked out how to do. And, and it, it concerns me that that isn't about human flourishing, that isn't about learning to be more human, that's about actually learning to be controlled, and that's learning to be a, a, a nothing more than a, a kind of, um, to, to quote um, Jacob Rees-Mogg, a, a vassal state, as it were. It, it, it's nothing more than a, um, a means to be simply a, um, a, a cog in the wheel, as it were. And, and that kind of gets demonstrated when you, you look at the um, adverts that came out recently and the one advert about the young, with, that had the young ballerina. And, and basically the advert was saying, Brexit means she can't dance anymore, so she better retrain for another job. And actually what they meant by that was retrain for a proper job, you know, retrain for something that's going to that's going to actually make something or bring in money or I don't know, shuffle, shuffle things around in the city or whatever. And, and, and that kind of human flourishing just completely gets lost, I think. And, and I return to uh, the um, seminar we had about three or four weeks ago on, on pedagogy and I reread my PhD recently, not all of it because it's incredibly dull. Um, but the um, but what I did read was the bit about pedagogy because it was about pedagogy and it kind of reminded me what I've forgotten about it and this idea of pedagogy being about being next to somebody um, supporting somebody uh, um, um, promoting human flourishing um, as opposed to the idea of of you, you know the the kind of Anglo-Saxon Anglo-American view of pedagogy which is basically the craft of teaching the the the, the art of teaching and the and the science of teaching, a kind of collapsed view of, of what it means to be a pedagogue, what it means to be somebody engaged in, in pedagogy. And I think we, we've lost that in, in the West in many ways. And, and I wonder, John will be able to tell us about this in the Nordic region. I get a sense that there's a lot more of the kind of the original view of pedagogy going on. But, but certainly I, I, I worry that what we have in, and this is getting to be a very long answer now, isn't it? Um, I, I worry that what we've what we've got in in Scotland, and I think less so than England. I think England is even further down the line than, than we are. Um, I, I think what we have in Scotland is is this continual search for answers about teaching and learning that can actually get everybody. We can close this this gap, and we can get everybody to get oh, I mean, seven nat fives and what is it five hires and three advanced hires and they can all go to university and they can all get good jobs and we can lower taxes because we don't have to have a welfare state and that's the answer to education you know and I, it, it bores me it's rubbish it's nonsense really to be honest with you sorry that was very long that's okay thank you paul i'm going to briefly hand over to the panel to see if um anybody would like to give a brief response to paul so we can fit in one more question before we finish Paul, I, I, I agree with you. That's it. It's the generation, the ever generation, ever ongoing generation of questions. 
and that's where we're at in education. We have an idea of where we want to go, what we want to achieve, this flourishing, this empowerment of people, this making, uh, realizing potential of people, whatever. And it, but is it that, or is it something else? We have an idea, it's nebulous. We know where we want to go. Um, the, ch the question, we change, we move. And I think this is where it's so important to bring the teacher voice in, to allow teachers to discuss this, to just to bring their experience and to say, you know what, it's not fixed, it moves, it moves according to context, but that doesn't mean it's changing, it just means it's a different view of it, a different way of, of, of discussing it perhaps, or a different way of expressing it. Um, so I think, yeah, to, to, to bring in as many voices as possible, to get as many of those questions, um, and not necessarily just for answering them, but just for the challenge that they set us and uh, the challenge to our way of thinking. Um, it should, you know, tying in with what you're saying there, John, and what one of the, um, was it Mark said there earlier on, you know, about, um, you know, being challenged, I suppose long ago, we, we had to, we had to travel in order to, to broaden our minds, in order to see something else, hear something else. Um, if this pandemic has taught us anything, it's that we, don't necessarily have to. We can sit and listen to one another in a context like this, be challenged, be provoked, be uh, entertained, and um, just generally come away with, as you say, more questions. But that's good. Thank you. Thanks, Celine. Dominic, John, do you want to have a brief response as well? Yeah, it was just, uh, Paul, it was a great, I think, um, uh, taking up this uh, tension, I think, between instrumentalism, this idea that education should be basically, what would you call it, um, uh, an instrument to promote growth in society, economic growth. It, it's about the job, it's about the instrumental thing, and kind of uh, the other side of education, which should not be forgotten, if I heard you correctly, the one about citizenship, the one about uh, uh, school also being um, a, a microcosm in some sense uh, uh, of uh, a democratic space or uh, uh, a place of uh, learning and a place of um, what we call it of um, curiosity and so on. That's what I heard. The Thank you. Thanks, John. There's some really interesting conversation going on in the chat, which is great. And we always like to see, we see that at our CIRA Connects as, events as well. But I'm conscious of time. And I know, Angela, you raised that um, Alison had put a question in the chat. So if that's okay, Alison, with you, I'll just put that to the panel just now. So she said, having listened to each of your respective presentations, what consolidated message would you share um, collectively as regards an informed and embodied way to think of and speak and write about educational research by educators. And if I could ask each of you to respond as a, a final closing thought, that would be great. Thank you. Um, John, I can see you on my screen just now. So would you like to start? Sorry about it. I, I need the question once more. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, John. Sorry, I was quite quick there. Apologies. Um, thinking about um, your consolidated message, um, what would you share as regards an informed and embodied way to think of and speak of and write about educational research by educators? And I, that's, a, that's a big question. It is. <laughs> well, I think I think the need is. I think education is many things. It's a normative endeavor, but it's also, uh, uh, what would you call it, a knowledge building uh, 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 common endeavor. Uh, um, uh, but I think in, in, in current times, I think I would like to take that up. Yeah, I think there's a, that's a huge need for education to, what would you call it, um, to take up the need to affirm diversity in, in these times of, uh, I think, nationalisms in these times of, of, of uh, yeah. uh, what would you call it, fake news. And uh, I think so much is happening on social media. We're going into our own uh, local uh, uh, public spheres uh, with the ones that agree with us and so on and so forth. I think education has uh, um, 
what would you call it, a huge, uh, uh, what would you call it, um, uh, uh, work to do uh, uh, in order to um, yeah, affirm diversity and in order. Thanks, John. That's a, a clear message about affirming diversity. Dominic, Celine, do either of you want to come in? Yeah, um, I think the, I mean, there's, I agree, it, it, it is the, almost the topic of the moment and of arguably forever. Um, it ties into what, you know, what has just been said by Paul about um, how we view policymaking and the influence of research. Um, I mean, for me, one of the touch points was the work I did on the Beira Clap Close to Practice Research Project, where we, close to practice, you might call practitioner inquiry or even action research. And there's lots of other terms, you know, network learning communities. All of these things we, within the time available, tried to look at through a, a systematic review. Um, and so, I just think perhaps what needs to happen is more of this kind of conversation, more of trying to reach agreement, which the questioner is pr provoking us in a, in a way, and I think that's very helpful. Just one other example at a very different level. Um, uh, the British Academy and the Royal Society um, did, have done some work and produced a report called Harnessing Educational Research. And so, of course, as an organization, we're a little bit prickly at first because we're thinking, well, wait a minute, that's the sort of thing we do. <laughs> um, and of course, the people doing this were eminent artists, scientists, uh, psychologists, and, and educationists. Um, but now what's happening is um, those, qu those questions are being considered very seriously and, and the difficulty as ever is in engaging the Department for Education, for example, in the conversation. They were present at the last meeting, but so I think it's the key question of our age, potentially. Um, and, and of course, I wouldn't dream of suggesting answers and don't have any. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Dominic. And Celine, last to you. Yeah, I think probably tying in with what both um, my colleagues have said there, um, diversity. Um, education to affirm diversity. And let's go with that. Um, diversity in those that engage in researching our practice, in, re in researching education. Um, diversity of questions, diversity of voices at the table, uh, diversity of outlooks, diversity of views, challenge sharing, Let's uh, bring the diversity on, let's bring the questions on and let that allow us to flourish and in, in, by extension to enable those around us to flourish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Celine. So I'd just like to say a huge thank you to our panel today and I think this really has emphasised and uh, the links that we have with Bira and Nira and with the SEI and very much looking forward to, in your words, John, using this meta space and creating this meta space to continue these discussions and questions and dialogue. And so watch this space. I'm sure at the CIRA Executive will be planning other events in the future where we can hopefully continue these links and discussions. So thank you very much to our panel for being with us today, Dominic Wise. Um, John Chrysler and Celine Healy, thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for participating. It sounds like great discussions were had in the breakout rooms and great questions and discussion in our uh, plenary session, so thank you. This is our, uh, we have our last event on Thursday this week and you can still register for that if you want to. And we're launching our um, document for supporting research uh, within the Scottish context. Um, we will be presenting the Estelle Brizard Award to Money Craig this year, and we will be um, having our CIRA um, annual general meeting, so you're all welcome to attend that. 
Our next CIRA Connects event in December is a follow-up event from the Scottish Physical Education Research Network. They had an event in June where they looked at, um, they had a panel discussion with deputy head teachers and head teachers talking about what they were thinking in terms of um, returning to school. And now with the return to school, we're following up on that to think about um, young people's health and well-being and how that's progressed uh, since the return to school, given the current COVID-19 situation. So that's on the 3rd of December and the information about that is live on our website and you can um, register for the event using Eventbrite as usual. And thank you very much again. If you want to carry on the conversation, please do on social media using the um, hashtag, hashtag CIRAConf20. And if you're interested in finding out more about CIRA or becoming a CIRA member, please go to our website to find out more. Um, if the panel and the, any members of the executive want to just stay on at the end so we can do a final thank you and everybody can leave and enjoy your evening. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.